You're going to love this. Just love it. Carbon-14 does not last longer than 100,000 years before it all decays into nitrogen-14. So why are dinosaur fossils thought to be millions of years old when they still have carbon-14? That is one big pile of shit. Hi everybody, thanks for watching, and welcome to my new YouTube channel, which I created for the purpose of joining the rest of the members of the online community who are interested in promoting science and opposing the pseudoscience that has misled so many people. In this video, I will be talking about something that is often cited as evidence in support of young earth creationism. To be more specific, for years, creationists have been citing radiocarbon dating of diamonds, coal, and dinosaur fossils as evidence that these things are on the order of only thousands of years old, and not millions, which is the scientific consensus. In the last few years, creationist websites have posted work by Hugh Miller and his colleagues alleging to have confirmed several dinosaur specimens to be within a few tens of thousands of years old or less. Their method of confirming this was radiocarbon dating. Before continuing, it might be helpful to review the basic gist of carbon dating if you're not already familiar with it, but very briefly, Solar radiation converts atmospheric nitrogen into a radioactive isotope of carbon that has an atomic mass of 14, instead of the most common isotope of carbon with an atomic mass of 12. Over time, carbon-14 undergoes radioactive decay with a half-life of approximately 5730 years. So in theory, scientists can determine the age of a preserved biological specimen like leather, wood, or bone by measuring its percentage of remaining carbon-14 relative to present-day levels. Hugh Miller and others have reportedly discovered preserved intact collagen inside dinosaur fossils. Collagen is a protein found in bone and is a major component of connective tissue. Furthermore, the presence of intact, albeit trace amounts of collagen in a T-Rex fossil was a discovery that helped make the paleontologist Mary Schweitzer famous. Miller and his team reported a similar discovery and also reportedly had the dinosaur collagen carbon dated the results of which have provided ammunition for the creationist community to claim that dinosaurs lived only thousands, not millions of years ago. But the problems with this carbon dating of dinosaurs claim are a multitude and began more than 20 years ago. For example, the Acrocanthosaurus specimen in this chart was apparently cited from Lionel Dahmer's 1990 paper published by Creation Science Fellowship and titled Report on Chemical Analysis and Further Dating of Dinosaur Bones and Dinosaur Petroglyphs. The bones tested were from museum collections and contained preservatives. Organic preservatives, such as epoxies and shellacs, would have interfered with the radiocarbon dating, making the radiocarbon ages unreliable. But this is only where the problems begin, so sit back, hang on, and enjoy. According to the 1992 issue of the NCSE publication Creation Evolution and the article Creationists Say Dinosaurs Lived with Man, published in the Columbus Dispatch by Lafferty in 1991, Hugh Miller obtained fragments of bone from museum specimens and sent them to the University of Arizona for radiocarbon dating. The museum curators warned him that the specimens contained shellac and other preservatives, and University of Arizona geochemistry professor Austin Long told Miller that the bone samples contained no collagen, a principal source of carbon in bone. So his uh, radiocarbon test results from the early 90s are highly suspect, due to the high likelihood of other sources of carbon being introduced to the tests, besides just the intrinsic carbon from the bone fragments. That is, if there was sufficient intrinsic carbon left for radiocarbon dating. It's even more suspicious that in the years from 2005 to 2009, almost 20 years later, the same guy is reporting the discovery of exactly what he needs to bolster his case for creationism, the dinosaur collagen that he didn't have back in the 90s. Scientists rightfully rejected Miller's radiocarbon dates of dinosaur fossils back then, so in the 2005 to 2009 range, when Mary Schweitzer makes science headlines by confirming trace amounts of collagen in a remarkably well-preserved T-Rex fossil, suddenly this creationist is making a similar discovery. How interesting. This brings me to my next point. The carbon dating results published in Miller's article here relies on radiocarbon dating of intact, uncontaminated dinosaur collagen. How does Miller know that what he reportedly discovered and carbon dated was in fact collagen? What specific tests did they use to detect collagen? What licensed laboratory conducted the tests? What other factors, such as fungal or microbial contaminants and bacterial biofilm, might give false positive results? What controls were used to rule out the possibility of false positives? 
Other tests sensitive to detecting collagen out of a background of other organic substances, whether by contamination or endogenous? Did they detect just collagen or collagen plus contaminants? If there were other contaminants present in the specimen, then even real dinosaur collagen would have yielded inaccurate dating results. One of the images published by the creationists shows an individual using bare hands and a hacksaw to cut through what is described as a triceratops femur bone. Why wasn't this done in a sterile laboratory setting, with the researcher using a surgical mask and gloves to eliminate contamination, instead of outside with bare hands where soil, sweat, and stuff floating through the air like skin cells, pollen, and fungal spores could have gotten into the sample and contributed trace amounts of carbon from contemporary sources? In situ contamination is likely to affect the sample regardless of how careful the diggers are. Pollen spores have been found as far down as Precambrian rock layers. By the way, the fossil of a pollen-producing plant is never found in Precambrian layers, hence the pollen spores show up there by contamination. Biofilm from soil bacteria can also introduce carbon contamination. Now the creationists argue that chemical pretreatment removes bacterial contaminants. But what they don't mention or don't understand is that alkali pretreatment with sodium hydroxide removes organic acids like humic acid, which is the principal carbon-based component of soil, but not necessarily protein-rich contaminants from humans or bacterial biofilm. When Mary Schweitzer reported the discovery of collagen from a dinosaur fossil, she was met with criticisms like some of those that I've already mentioned. So what did she do? She performed a wide range of appropriate tests to confirm the presence of osteocyte proteins, including immunohistochemistry, mass spectrometry, and atomic force microscopy. Even so, she still reported the presence of contamination from soil bacteria, which would have affected the carbon dating results if fragments from Schweitzer's T-Rex specimen had been sent out for radiocarbon dating. So it's highly unlikely that Miller's claim of uncontaminated collagen is true, however much he might insist otherwise. Perhaps even more suspicious than the insistence that his collagen discoveries are uncontaminated is the amount of collagen he reported. In this article, Hugh Miller and the other two authors report that about 0.3% collagen was obtained from the interior of the fossilized Triceratops femur, or 30 milligrams from an 8.4 gram sample. I call bullshit. The collagen discovered and reported by Mary Schweitzer and her team of scientists was found to be in the subfemtomol range for the alpha-1 type 1 collagen subunit analyzed by mass spectrometry from a 30 milligram bone sample which corresponds to roughly 0.00046%. So the uh, collagen discovered by Miller and his team was apparently not only uncontaminated, but was more than 600 times higher concentration, putting it conveniently within the range of a sufficient sample size for radiocarbon dating. Furthermore, unlike Mary Schweitzer, they report absolutely no data and no test results whatsoever to justify their claim that what they found was collagen. Instead, what they say is, Harvard scientists have confirmed that proteins from the collagen detected in the famous T-Rex was definitely collagen as determined by sequencing the fraction. Thus, there is no reason to believe that what our lab has extracted is not collagen. In other words, other scientists found dinosaur collagen, so there's no reason to believe that we haven't. Never mind the fact that other scientists found only trace amounts of collagen, insufficient for radiocarbon dating, and that contamination from soil bacteria and human keratin from dust, skin, and hair are common and were reported as being present in the T-Rex collagen discovered by Mary Schweitzer's team. But Mary Schweitzer and her team were able to sequence the collagen separately from the sources of protein contamination using liquid chromatography and tandem mass spectrometry. So far I haven't found any reason to believe that Hugh Miller performed any similar such analysis with the samples of collagen that his team allegedly discovered. So unless Miller and his team make the results of the analysis that supposedly confirm the presence of collagen open and available to the public, as any credible scientist should, and Mary Schweitzer did with her discoveries, I call bullshit on the carbon dating of dinosaur collagen claimed by Miller and his team. Think about this. Finding trace amounts of badly degraded dinosaur protein took years of hard work for professional paleontologists like Mary Schweitzer to accomplish using modern facilities and well-preserved fossils. And these folks, who have an a priori reason to favor younger ages, seem to be finding large amounts of preserved intact dinosaur protein with ease, in sufficient quantities to send out for carbon dating, although not making the entirety of their data available to the public domain. Again, I call bullshit. Furthermore, any specimen, regardless of age, 
will carbon date to under 100,000 years due to carbon-14 background levels and sample contamination, both in situ contamination and contamination introduced during sample extraction and preparation. But you should also consider that even 100,000 years is well beyond the practical limit typical of carbon dating labs. In fact, there is no exact specific limit. Rather, the older a sample dates, from 20,000 to 30,000 to 50,000 years and beyond, the degree of uncertainty increases as it becomes more difficult to discern the sample's own carbon-14 from the background levels. Since the handful of anomalous radiocarbon dates reported by Miller and his team only represent one testing method, and since its reliability decreases with increasing age of the sample, and since the writers of that website withhold some of their data, like their test results for detecting collagen, and since background and contamination can introduce uncertainty to radiocarbon dating results, which they simply claim without justifying that this wasn't an issue, and since the true test of an unexpected scientific discovery is whether different methods cross-confirm one another, Hugh Miller and his team should not limit their tests to radiocarbon dating alone. Where is the cross-confirmation from other methods of analysis? If dinosaurs lived only thousands of years ago, where are the examples of their skeletons buried in the same layers as those of other large wild animals known to occupy the same regions? Why are no dinosaur fossils ever found in the same rock layers as lions, tigers, and bears? Why do we never find a tertiary triceratops, or a Pleistocene pachycephalosaurus, or for that matter, a Devonian dolphin, or a Cretaceous cat? Some creationists claim that the great flood of Noah sorted organisms according to their habitat or their mobility, or both, citing this as the reason for marine invertebrates always being found in the deepest fossil layers, while humans are always found in the shallowest layers. But then why are dinosaurs always found below the KT boundary? Did the geraniums and sloths just happen to outrun the dinosaurs when escaping the rising floodwaters? Why is it so hard to find dinosaurs preserved well enough for DNA sequencing, as we do with specimens actually known to be on the order of thousands of years old, such as with humans and animal remains already known to be under 20,000 years old? Apart from some highly dubious radiocarbon test results of what they claim but don't show as dinosaur collagen, they offer no reason to question the large time span between dinosaurs and modern humans agreed upon by the scientific consensus. Furthermore, they don't discuss why the vertical distribution of fossils shows a clear progression of traits illustrating exactly what we'd expect if different depths in the fossil record are separated by the passage of time. By the way, the discovery of dinosaur soft tissue by itself is often cited as evidence in favor of young earth creationism. What was actually discovered were trace amounts of organic material of a biological source packed among the minerals within the interior of a fossilized bone shielded from the environment. Samples collected from the interior of fossilized bone had to undergo a chemical treatment to demineralize the material before the organic components became soft and pliable. Leaving aside the fact that the creationists often oversimplify what was actually discovered, two conclusions could conceivably be put forth. Mineralized tissue from fossils that still become pliable after undergoing demineralization treatment indicates that they are much younger than scientists previously thought. Or, mineralized tissue from fossils that still become pliable after undergoing demineralization treatment indicates that being embedded in densely packed minerals can preserve organic material much longer than scientists previously thought. What creationists have done is immediately clung to the first explanation without offering any justification for why it should be favored over the second. I haven't addressed every single point raised by these creationists about their carbon dating of dinosaurs claim because, frankly, it would take a hell of a long time to take this article apart and point out everything that's wrong with it piece by piece. But I have pointed out what I believe are the three largest and most obvious reasons not to mistake this trash for scientific research. Number one, they do not fully disclose all their raw data and relevant test results, as is standard practice in the scientific community leaving us good reason to doubt that they found sufficient enough quantity of intact, uncontaminated collagen for radiocarbon dating. Number two, they either ignore or dismiss without justifying the number of factors that could contribute to anomalous radiocarbon measurements in their samples, including protein-containing contaminants, such as bacterial biofilms and instrument background. They claim, citing the inventor of the radiocarbon dating method, that collagen cannot be contaminated. This is wrong. Dinosaur collagen discovered and reported in the scientific literature was contaminated by other sources of carbon. By the way, the inventor of the radiocarbon dating method was Willard Libby, not Walter, and 40 million years is not younger than 46,000. I guess factual accuracy isn't a priority for these people, nor is trustworthiness, as they cite private communication as reference material for important data that the rest of their paper relies on. 
they also claim that bacterial contamination wouldn't be an issue because the bacteria would be the same age. But this is ludicrous. Bacteria reproduce. They grow, spread, and multiply, and can infiltrate porous bone and even rock. Number three, they neglect using any other experimental methods to cross-confirm their results, which is suspicious by itself, even if they didn't already have a known history of sloppy protocol and a preconceived conclusion with which they're trying to make the evidence fit. Now, I have no a priori commitment to dinosaurs going extinct millions of years ago. I was a literal six-day creationist for a lot longer than the amount of time that has passed since then. I would personally love to believe that dinosaurs were alive only thousands of years ago. But more important than what I would personally like to believe is what can be reasonably deduced from the available facts and evidence. And so far, I still haven't seen anything to justify the belief that dinosaurs lived more recently than about 65 million years ago. Thanks for watching, everybody. Once again, more videos to come in the near future. And if you're enjoying these so far, please take a moment to rate, comment, and subscribe.